happy Sunday morning and welcome to Collider Mailbag. Uh, it's pretty. It's a pretty awesome day here. It's a banner day at Collider Mailbag. I think you can see why immediately. And if you're listening to us, you're going to hear why in just a second. But I'm your host, John Roca, and I welcome uh, to the show the ex-host or the host before me, the previous host of this show, but someone who's gone on to do a million other things right now on Collider and Collider.com. Her reviews, her videos, uh, Collider Witching Hour, so much is happening. Uh, FYC is uh, blowing up like crazy now that it's award season. Uh, welcome to the show, writer, host, producer, editor, and all things great, Perry Nemiroff. Dude, you're you? making me blush. Stop. <laughs> uh, it's weird how right this feels. I've been like, I missed this. I yeah, really yeah. did miss oh, you this mean a going lot. Back yeah. Onto the set, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, I miss yeah. this a lot. The only thing that's really distracting me right now is I wish everybody could see your little like snack table in yeah, the corner. Yeah, terrible like, snack what, table. What is that? That's a uh, triple walnut chocolate cookie that I get from Panera. It is it's mighty early in the morning. Yeah, well, I'm a sh <laughs> I'm, I need sugar. It's like other people have coffee. I can't yeah, function on that's coffee. That's what I got with me. Sugar is my thing. So okay. I, in the mornings, I okay. have to have one little sweet thing to <laughs> balance out my salty breakfast. So that's how I work. I am of the mind the that there aren't too many sweets for a single yeah, that's person. A fair point. So that's I, a that's fair point. probably the wrong advice to give, but I like it. <laughs> what you didn't see is I was texting with this new nutritionist who was supposed to give me great advice Ooh, about what I'm going to start share eating. Share that now. advice, please. Sure. Sure, sure. Uh, anyway, today we're not talking about our health approach, <laughs> our approaches to health. We're talking about your questions here in Cloud of Mailbag. Remember that when you when we put the call out, uh, Dorian does on social media, on Instagram, and on uh, Twitter. Please put that hashtag Collider Mailbag on your question. It makes it easier for us to find, to pick out, and possibly answer on the show. And if you want to email us, you can do so at mailbag at collider.com. That's mailbag at collider.com. But anyway, are we ready, Perry? I am very ready. I'm All so right. excited for this. Let's jump into this. <laughs> Our first question, it is from Twitter, at I am Brendan Barr. All right, thanks for telling us who you are. Do you think the Rise of Skywalker final trailer needed to show off some of the plot? I feel like we still don't know anything about the actual plot now even with the final trailer released. Perry. So I think the bigger question is, does Star Wars and does Disney need to even market these movies? At all? Like, no, people are going to see it. Yes, marketing probably helps boost sure. the ticket sales from one level to the next, but I don't think they have to reveal any of the story, which is why, wait, I actually want your opinion oh, on this. Okay. Did you hear about my bet with Christian? No, no, what's your bet? So on Jedi Counts, I'm, I'm asking everybody about this now because I'm very stressed about it. I don't want to be a sore loser, but mm -hmm. I see it going one way or the other. On Jedi Council, he bet that we would see Palpatine in the latest trailer and mm. I said I said no way we're not going to see him in his full form as they're presenting him in the movie right. so what do you make of the way that we saw him in the trailer does that tilt the win in Christian's direction no. or in mine it tilted in yours we did not see him full okay. but don't be surprised that Christian Harlov tries to get out of paying on a bet that he loses I've seen that happen a number of times or kind of switch the thing a little bit so he doesn't have to pay out admittedly, nothing against Christian I know admittedly but it it's fun. semantics yeah though. Sure. It's like we're we're analyzing the exact words we used at this point to tilt the bet one well, way or the other. Well, you said full form. Yeah, full I, did form say, I did say full form. Full form. But, we but seen admittedly, the full form. In, in all truth, I also did say, you know, if we see Palpatine, I think it's going to be in, you know, archival footage, footage from previous mm, films, which, right. you know, kind of ruins my argument a little bit, but it's also, it, it's still full form. Yeah, we didn't see his face, no, right? No. So I mean, and who knows, that, who knows that was even him in the cloak? Exactly. We don't know that was we him in the cloak. We don't know for sure. It probably is, but you don't know for well, sure. and there's no way they're showing the destruction of of Palpatine too if that's him in that Darth Vader kind of sequence uh, there where they get when he gets destroyed by Kylo and uh, and Rey. Oh, uh, yeah. oh. Yeah, I don't know well, if that's I mean, him. we don't even know exactly. what... I mean, we don't know if that's even an individual or if it's a thing. Exactly. I, I took it to be a thing, and for a split second, I thought that was maybe Darth Vader's uh, helmet that mm. they were smashing to pieces. Right, right, right. Oh, that's a good point. Could mm. be. But see, that the fact that we're even asking these questions, having these convers this conversation about it, I think it's a positive, and I, I don't think they needed to release much of the plot. Look, you're going to go. You know it's closing. The, the Skywalker loop. So I think the less we know about the film, the I better. I with my mind. <laughs> that was pretty scary. It's Christian yelling right now. I think the, the, the less we know about it, the better, because I'd rather go in completely not knowing a damn thing because I already know I'm going to be in that theater to see what J.J. does with this and how they close all the loops uh, and then give us some hope for the future by the end of the movie. So I don't think it needed to do I the plot. I have this feeling that light is going to go out in the next few minutes. It, it's, it 
it's been flickering. Yeah, it's a it's, little it's bit of a ghost thing. It's because this is the last weekend before Halloween. This yeah, is a, this was a choice. It's also because you got the witching hour thing going. You're, putting, you're Maybe, trying to scare yeah. the crap out of me. I know how you work. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our next question, Barry. Oh, I read it. Yes, that's how this works. <laughs> An email from Derek Wal- uh, Walker Jr. He's writing, Good afternoon, my friends at Collider. With NBC Universal starting the Peacock streaming service soon, do you think that'll affect Universal's box office? If people can see all of Universal's movies and TV shows for free, won't they be tempted to not pay for a 12 to $20 movie ticket and just wait for it to debut on the streaming service in three months like people do with Amazon Studio Movies? Thank you and have a wonderful week weekend. Well, you talk about the Peacock streaming service. It's it's launching next April, and this is from a, a, a report in Vulture uh, from September. Uh, the Office is going to be on there in 2021. Uh, Parks and Rec is going to go on there. They're going to uh, bring back that uh, Save by the Bell kind of reboot or whatever, a Punky Brewster reboot. My God, what is that all about? Uh, Late Night's Amber Ruffin is going to have a talk show there, and Mike Shore from The Good Place is going to do a show. Then you'll have these Universal uh, Library films and DreamWorks and films, but most importantly, reruns of Downton Abbey, for God's sake. So finally, <laughs> Perry, you can watch all yes, the seasons yes. once and for all there on the Peacock streaming service. But they haven't said a launch date or a price point yet, but they did say that it would come included in a package so you wouldn't have to pay extra for it. So that's what you need to know, and you could buy it separately as well. But that being said, the question is, will this affect? I don't think so. I think it depends on the movie. It'll depend on the project. People, Some people want to go see things in theaters. Like The Irishman, right? This is a great example. We saw, you saw it again last night. I saw it for the first time last night at the time we're recording this but you that's a movie you got to see in the theaters as much you may enjoy it in streaming service i think seeing it in theaters gives it the kind of epic feel to it i semi disagree on that point now so the first time i walked out of the movie i said this briefly on movie talk on friday Uh but i said you know I didn't fidget at all. I didn't have to use the restroom. And I still maintain the fact that I think this movie warrants that really long runtime. I think the epic nature of the story enhances the character arcs right. and what they go through in the movie. I was very, very uncomfortable when we saw the movie the second time. Okay. I had definitely had enough. And I think it was a matter of circumstance because mm-hmm. like, we waited for a good while before the movie started. So yeah. it wasn't just the three and a half hour runtime. It was an extra 30 to 60 minutes of yes. sitting and waiting. Yeah. So sitting there and feeling that it made me think that, yeah, it it's a very cinematic movie that is highly enjoyable on the big screen, mm-hmm. but Netflix might be the right place for an experience like that. So okay. somebody can not, I don't want anyone to feel afraid of feeling that during a movie and right. not seeing it for that reason. Well, what about the question here? So, Do you think it will affect yeah. Universal's box office? I've been thinking about this. So initially when I first read the question, the first thing that I thought to myself is, is no, no way. Mm. Because even before everybody launched their own individual streaming service, we still had these movies going to other services yeah. and those other services didn't stop people from seeing them in the theater. But now that every almost every single studio has their own service and you got to spread that money around so much, it's mm. like my mentality would be if this year, this calendar year, I'm paying for, I, I'm just making up arbitrary sure, numbers. Sure. If I'm paying for three streaming services, but next year when so many more launch, I'm paying for six, one of them happens to be Peacock in order to save more money. Why don't I just focus on Peacock and cut out the expenses I would have in the theater to see Universal movies? Mm. That mentality does make some sense to me. Well, I also find it interesting too, because this is a way for the cable companies to kind of fight back, to kind of reclaim that streaming service, uh, a little more ground in the streaming service war, but being like, well, if you pay for cable you'll also get this you also get peacock or you also mm-hmm. get i think hbo max is another one that you'll get if you keep your cable you'll also get that um and so those kinds of things they're a way of fighting back situations you still buy it separately if you want pay it monthly uh, separate fee for it but this is their way of kind of do so i think the last thing they want to do is affect their box office mm-hmm. overall by what they're doing so if they see that happening i think there'll be adjustments coming down the road for something like that so but but it's all an unknown right now because we are certainly in an incredible time of transition in many sure. ways. Yeah. All right. Our third question, it comes from uh, a Twitter question. It's from at Wayne Core. Uh, they ask, do you think a trailer for Wonder Woman will be released before Christmas? Obviously, I picked this question before uh, the announcement was made yeah, that yeah. trailer's coming. So, so I think, let's talk I about think it. we know the actual yeah. answer to this question because Patty Jenkins did take to Twitter mm-hmm. to announce that 
the Wonder Woman 1984 trailer is going to be uh, debuting. At, uh, it's called the Comic-Con Experience, which is shortened to CCXP mm-hmm. in Brazil, of course. We've actually covered that event yeah, for Frosty's years. Gone, and yeah. yeah, I think he's going again this yes, year. He, he might be taking someone else with him, too. Oh, yeah, so, I heard Adam Shitwood is yeah, in play. Maybe expect even more coverage from there, including this. But mm-hmm. she did reveal that the trailer is going to debut there. And then I think I wrote that. De- yeah. So she wrote, so excited to bring uh, Wonder Woman 84 to the fans in Brazil. And then after that, she wrote, and the world, which would lead one to believe it's not going to be like the Spider-Man trailer to be debuted there last year yeah. where everybody saw it there and everyone else had to wait. This is probably going to be both in Brazil and online Do the same the, day, if this, not the day after. This is interesting, Perry, because you think the timing is right for this. Because, I mean, you know, obviously Comic-Con in San Diego used to be the place where people debuted stuff. But now they're starting to debut stuff at New York Comic-Con. And now this is Brazil. Con- this is, this yeah. con is huge. Yeah. This okay, con right. is huge. It is massive. It's like... Yes, we are steeped in domestic box office and what's right. going on in the States, but worldwide is super, super important with yeah. the movie's success. And that convention is enormous. I think that's the perfect place. And I think it's about time that they unveil a first mm-hmm, trailer mm-hmm. for this movie. So really no better place. And, you know, there's something about, I feel like there's something about December that, you know, it's the end of the year. Yeah. It makes you Christmas, look forward to yeah. the year to come. So I, I think it's perfect. And we're going to have a bunch of huge movies coming out mm-hmm. all throughout December that this trailer can be attached to. I think they're making the right move. Yeah, I think so, too. And you make a great point. The fact that it's a it's a, 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 a global uh, Comic-Con, in essence, one of the biggest global. So and this film, look, uh, Wonder Woman is from Themyscira. She's not from America, right? She comes to it. So it's more of a global appeal as well from the inherent nature of that hero. So I like that uh, decision as well. And I think it's exciting to see something debut there because then mm-hmm. it takes the eyes of the world go to this now and people pay more attention to it. I feel bad for the organizers next year because that probably means way more people are going to want to try and be a part of it. That's how it works at these cons. So we'll see. But I'm looking forward to it. I think it's interesting to put it in December. I hope it won't get you know like lost in all the other stuff because it certainly deserves its own uh, attention for that. So mm-hmm. uh, all right, let's move on to our next, oh, next question. Next question? No, okay. no. I'm I was taking a cue from you. I, <laughs> no, it's, it is really exciting to to come back and see the things that you've uh, you've spiced up and oh. made your own. The pillars that you've held on to. I, I love sitting here Thank right you, now. That's very nice of you. Uh, question four from Zachary Shelton. Hello there. I have noticed that in the current trilogy that Finn and Poe are more in the background. Do you like them focusing more on Rey and Kylo? Do you think Finn and Poe will get more to do in Rise of Skywalker? I think absolutely Finn and Poe will get more to do, but I think it's always been the Kylo and Rey story or Rey and Kylo story, Mm -hmm. depending on who you want to put first. And I would rather them focus on that. I know people have complained about the Finn situation, but if they did did all of a sudden a massive uh, readjustment for Finn, I think I'd be a little disappointed by that he's kind of a ancillary he's kind of a, a, a secondary character to what the overall story is if they had wanted to focus on his story i think we would have gotten more about his background more about his struggles of being a, a stormtrooper who is you know kind of turned his back on the uh, first order and wants to do something else with the rebellion but it hasn't played out that way same thing with poe uh, poe had the little bit thing with leia and all of that that connection there and holdo uh, but i think it's always been the dark and the light and the dark and the light are kylo and and ray so I, I think we'll get a little more with them because it's a two hour and 35 minute runtime, but I don't think you need to have much more with them. I mean, yes, this is primarily Ray and Kylo's story, mm. but I, I don't know. I think we forget maybe because admittedly it was the weaker part of Last Jedi that yeah. Finn still had a pretty significant amount of screen time in that movie. Mm. And I think he's going to have uh, probably a similar, <laughs> it's really weird to me because of fantasy football, how I'm thinking like, oh, like the RB split time. This way. <laughs> That's like how I'm about to articulate this, but I think we're going to see a similar oh split in what play, have we in done play to time in Rise of Scott. You guys have ruined me. Um, but I think we're going to see a similar split between the characters yeah. in the next movie too. It is, I think, the whole Rise of Skywalker, no matter how you are interpreting it at this moment, I think that is very much tied to who Rey and Kylo are as individuals mm-hmm. and what the two of them coming together means. I think that's what this entire new trilogy has largely been about. Yeah. But Finn and Poe both also have arcs. I think we have already explored it pretty significantly in the last two films, mm-hmm. and we need to wrap up their storylines as well. And I think we're going to get a lot of screen time with them. Yeah, you make a good point, actually, you know, because you had the Rose, uh, the Rose 
frozen uh, uh, Finn situation when they went off to uh, that. Pl- I, I don't even want to remember it where they went. Canto, Canto bite. bite. And then uh, you had this thing with Phasma as well. So certainly Finn had two separate storylines he was yeah. playing with in Jedi. What your, whatever your feelings are about the movie. And Poe, of course, trying to discover where he belongs in the whole situation. Because remember, Force Awakens starts with Poe. Yeah. Having that conversation right at the beginning there. So the whole new trilogy starts with Poe having that conversation with Lord Van Tekken. So, okay, that's a thing there. But yeah, I, but I think what's going to solve the problem is what we saw in that in the trailer. All of them in the Millennium Falcon together, all of them on that barge. So once that becomes a whole thing where they're all a group, then you don't have to worry about the other separate storylines. And look, the original trilogy, Luke was the focus. Leia and Han were a package deal. And it's not like R2, D2, and C3PO had their own narratives. It was everyone was kind of like a package deal. And there was Luke. Luke was the focus. This, you had four separate people who had storylines that were distinct and had to be explored. So they had their work cut out for them. Did they always get it right? Probably not. But I think they'll wrap it all up fine in the last one. At least I hope so. I, no, I really do think. Yeah. I think I think the key word here is, or key words, is satisfying conclusion. Yes. I think that's top priority across the board. And I do really think that's what we're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Our last question. This is one I specific, picked specifically for Perry. Oh, no. Uh, because oh, we no. did this. Okay. We did see the movie. Uh, email. This is an email from Thomas Benjamin. He asks, hello, Roca and guest. Do you think that Martin Scorsese's recent quotes about Marvel movies will have any p- impact on the Irishman's Oscar chances? Considering how many Academy members are not only fans of comic book movies, I don't know how you know that, Thomas, but many have worked on comic book movies themselves. It seems like a real possibility to at least have an effect of the best picture race considering the preferential ballot system. Thanks, as always. Parrot. No, I think the answer to this is no. It's not It's it's not going to affect his chances. I. So, you know, we've discussed this on Movie Talk a lot. We've had some great conversations. I do think one of our best conversations on the topic, Mm -hmm. because I think it gets to the heart of what all this really means, rather than like, oh, he said, she said, he doesn't like my thing, she doesn't like my thing kind of of a scenario, is we spoke on Friday's Movie Talk. I urge you to go back to listen to this conversation about an article that Matt Goldberg wrote explaining the whole situation Mm. and where these sentiments could really be coming from and why they matter. And I think he puts out very clearly that... Like part of the reason why it's upsetting, and this is something that I kept pushing on Movie Talk mm-hmm. too, is that you know, you don't like to feel like your opinion and your feelings aren't being respected. And I think the way that their points are being arti- articulated might make a Marvel fan feel that way. So yeah. I understand that. But what Matt also gets at is that these comments, first of all, the idea of saying to Martin Scorsese, "What do you think of Marvel movies?" doesn't even necessarily mean Martin Scorsese. What do you think about the individual movies in the mm. MCU? That's using. I think they're being used. The Marvel movies are being used as a catch-all kind of yeah, thing, yeah. as like big budget epic blockbusters, whereas Martin Scorsese could only make The Irishman happen at Netflix. So I think it's just this larger concern of auteur directors feeling like they are being pushed out and having less opportunities mm. than they did before because of how popular Marvel movies are. Yeah, That is the gist of the conversation. I don't think this is going to bleed into the uh, Oscar situation whatsoever, but if anything, Jeff brought this up on Friday's Movie Talk too. It's another worthwhile point to make. Mm. Think about how many people the MCU movies employ. Think about how many people Netflix employs. That does come into you know the equation when it comes to giving movies Oscar nominations yeah. Yeah. because those people are voting members. Yeah. So just a, a, an idea to keep in your back pocket, but I don't think this is a type of backlash that's going to hurt his Oscar chances. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the, the thing, if anything, it might even increase their Oscar the Oscar chances because I think there's a strong contingent of people within the Academy who feel the way that Martin Scorsese does. Yes, it's getting younger. It's getting more diverse, certainly in that way, but Green Book still won Best Picture, and I've got my feelings about that and that to me indicates there's still this desire to go towards the conventional approaches to certain subjects so you look at the Irishman this is going back to the old school type of making movies you have someone who's been in the academy for a number of decades now Martin Scorsese Robert De Niro Al Pacino Joe Pesci people who were carrying film for a number of decades before the current Marvel movies we have now so there's a matter of respect so I think it doesn't affect his chances at all because he's above it in that way. The respect people have for him is above it in that way. And I think, uh, if anything, like I said, it increases it. But I think you bring up an interesting point too here, Perry. This idea of uh, what Matt Goldberg said and what you all discussed Mm -hmm. on Movie Talk. We discussed a little bit on Riley Roundtable as well. And my contention was that Scorsese is still a filmmaker still in the game. I think Coppola is just a troll doing his thing. And that's just Coppola. He's always done that. But Scorsese is the more interesting approach here. It's like, where's that coming from? And then you feel the anger. And I was 
starting to look at it from the Marvel fans point of view, the ones who've been upset about these comments. And it comes back to this. They have pushed that boulder up the hill for the last since since Dark Knight that they want their films that they love to be respected and revered in a certain way like the classic films are. And they think great filmmakers are involved in these things like Ryan Coogler, Taika Waititi, so many great names you can throw out there who are creating uh, fantastic films that they don't want disrespected by people of another time. So pushing the boulder up the hill and it's been such a struggle to get accepted to have someone come along and just smack the boulder and make it feel like it's rolling all the way back down the hill. You're retreading yeah. stuff that you thought you had gotten to before. So I've changed my mind about that a little bit over this week in the discussions we've had that I'm starting to see why these Marvel fans feel the same way because I was like, why do you care? But then I understand why they do care. Yeah. So. It's one thing to have a different opinion than someone else right. about a movie, but it's another thing to make you feel like your opinion is less than. Yeah, And right. I think that's that's part of this issue that we're dealing with right, right now. Right. That's, a fe that's the inherent feeling that people yeah, get yeah. from you these never, comments. You never want to have that feeling yourself and you never want to give it to somebody else. Yeah, you yeah. always want to, you know, make your points, back them up, but be respectful about a differing opinion. Absolutely. It's that simple. Uh, one last thing, uh, and this is my edition. Um, Fantasy football. What? Do you <laughs> I'm just kidding. Guys, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> You're the host of FYC. Uh, <laughs> okay. The Irishman, what are the best picture chances in your opinion? Can you preview that? Can you give a little... I think it's going to get a nomination. That's what I you'll can't, say. I can't can't say right now. We we still have so much more to go, we and it's like two more months of you know. This time last year, if you had asked me, for example, what do you think a Star Is Born's chances of winning a lot of mm. Oscar nominations are at this point in time, I would have said very very good. And yeah. then look what happened. It got so many nominations and just one single solitary win. Yeah, you never know. We still have so much time ahead of it's us. A fair points, fair points. Certainly, this is certainly it lived up to the hype in my opinion, and it will be nominated for Best Picture. Might even win. We'll see. Uh, it's, I, I still say Joker, but that's me. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching this uh, episode of Collider Mailbag on this lovely Sunday morning, afternoon, evening, depending on when you're watching. I really appreciate you all taking the time to watch or to listen to us. As I said before, uh, and I've said numerous times before, yes, I know some of you have complained numerous times on Twitter that it's not in podcast form anymore, but it kind of still is. If you connect it to the Bluetooth, put it in your headphones and just hit play. You can walk around and still have it feel like it's in podcast form uh, there in your headphones. I want to thank Perry Nemiroff so much thank for stopping you. by. Thank you for having me. My, my pleasure. Uh, please, what are you up to? What are you plugging? Anything you want to talk about? What am I plugging? I'll plug Movie Talk every single day at 9 a.m. Pacific. I hope this is okay to plug, but please. exactly a week from today, and depending on when you're listening to this, I could be running my very first marathon. Hey and so I've got a week to go, and I have a little ways to go as far as uh, my campaign for North Shore Animal League because I'm running on their behalf, and I'm raising my goal is to raise three thousand dollars and i'm fairly close right now but uh not close enough so you know oh, if, you, if you if you want to if you want to support a really great organization that loves animals just as much as i do uh it's a pinned tweet on my twitter account so check it out there you go and you can find that at p nemeroff to go there and Thank find you. that twin <laughs> find that and and donate and get there get her over the three thousand so she can run she's been training so hard for this thing overcome a, overcame a foot injury as well in the middle of training so to keep going so give her some love there and especially Thank if you, you love animals Animals. It's a fair. And, uh, you know, shout out to Dewey out there. Um, thanks, everybody. You can find me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, and once again, if you want to send your stuff in, put that hashtag Collider Mailbag on your Instagram and Twitter questions. And also email us at mailbag at collider.com. Shout out to Adam Smith in the booth. And we'll talk to you next time. Have a great rest of your Sunday and a great rest of your week until we see you again.